a dream of falling towards endless darkness, a voice begging him to wake up. This is the start of a journey towards freedom. A man imprisoned inside a cell wakes up from a nightmare. He then hears a woman's voice from another room, telling him to take heed of the wall spikes behind him. The wall moves. It inches closer, closer, and closer to the man. Panic surges through him, and he frantically searches for a way out of the prison cell. But there's no escape. The woman echoes this, telling him that the door can't be opened from the inside. In his panic, he accuses the woman of placing him inside the cell. But he soon finds out that she's a victim too. The woman cries, so he comforts her. Though he's clueless about their situation, he assures her that they shouldn't lose hope no matter what. Upon noticing the axe beside her, he suggests that she use it to crack the window open to get out. The woman tells him that there's no window in her cell, so he asks for the axe instead. He plans on cutting through the window in his room, then circling back to save her. The woman makes him promise that he'll come back for her. If he doesn't, then she'd rather they die there together. The man's name is Ning Yuan, and he swears to the woman that he will never leave her behind. She tries to pass the axe through the hole in the wall, but it can't fit through. The fixture's made of granite too, so there's no way to make the hole bigger. It's no use. The woman cries harder as the helplessness of their situation envelopes her. To this, Ning Yuan tells her to please stop crying already. He can't think while she's acting that way. Thinking of what? The woman asks. In 10 more minutes tops, we'll become spaghetti sauce. After just one blow, the axe receives a broken edge, and the woman didn't even make a dent in the wall. It really is hopeless, and she laments how she hasn't even had her first kiss yet. Ning Yuan keeps his head in the game and asks her how she ended up there, but she has no idea. She was just napping in a subway, and the next thing she knew, she's in an iron bed. This sparks an idea in him. He asks her to crush the iron bed and give him a bar. This way, he can pry open his wooden window and get out. The woman asks how he would save her, and he says that the roof is just rotten wood. He'll climb up there after he gets out and smash the roof to get her out. The woman successfully breaks the bed and hands him an iron bar. Ning Yuan then uses this to break the wooden window in his cell and finally gets out. Finally, something good is happening to them. Now all that's left to do is climb to the roof to save the woman. While Ning Yuan's outside, the spiked wall continues to move closer and closer. The woman, Su Jin, can only cry and talk to herself, saying, Don't abandon me, Ning Yuan. As she's stuck in her cell, she recalls a memory of her hiking together with her friends on a winter day. Things took a sordid turn when a guy named Jian hurt his ankle, and as an internal medicine major, she managed to tend to his injury. The others, who were uninjured, talked to her, saying that they plan to leave Jian behind. If they wait for his recovery, none of them will survive. They have to leave him behind and just rescue him later. Su Jin disagreed with this. One of the guys said that it's either that or they all die there. When he heard this, Jian insisted that he's just injured, not dead. Before the others left, they gave him half of their food supply. Su Jin decided to stay behind with him. Time passed, and while tending to his injury, Su Jin shared that she had forgiven the other two who had abandoned them. They did what they had to, which was to search for the rescue team. Meanwhile, she's the only one who could tend to his injury. She also mentioned that her father would always tell her that in times of survival, everything will be forgiven by the god of war. But Jian didn't even seem to be listening. Instead, he cupped her face, making a move on her as he cooned about how nice she is. How absurd it was that a simple act of kindness was seen as a sign of deeper romantic emotions. Su Jin stopped his advances by going somewhere to find food and herbs before it got too late. Like how the other guys abandoned him, Jian also abandoned his shame as he told her to be his girlfriend if they make it out alive. Su Jin subtly turned him down, saying that compared to athletes, she preferred intelligent guys. As soon as she gathered enough herbs and food, she excitedly returned to the cave only to find that Jian had left her alone, with nothing but a note that read, In times of survival, everything will be forgiven. Oh, what's this? He was turned down so he decided to abandon her? The woman who risked her life just to stay with him? He was turned down so he all but left her to die? What a shocking turn of events! Back to the present, Su Jin still in her cell, crying and thinking that men are all the same and that they're all just looking out for themselves. She's so certain that Ning Yuan will not come back for her. Suddenly, the roof breaks and Ning Yuan's hand reaches out to get her. He tells her, Can't you stop cursing for a little while? I promised you, and I always keep my words. With that, Su Jin is saved. As soon as the two of them are out of there, she can't help but give him a hug out of relief. While babbling out her thanks, the overjoyed woman is all but choking him with her hug. When she realizes what she's doing, she lets him go, apologizes, and introduces herself as a sophomore student in medical college. Whew, slow down, ma'am. Su Jin then asks him what he is, but Ning Yuan's too busy observing their surroundings. After looking around, he asks, What the hell is this place? Moments later, he realizes they're at a lighthouse. With the rain still pouring and the two of them soaking wet, they look for a way to come down. They find a door that leads to a steel ladder and use it to descend. Soon after, Ning Yuan realizes that the ladder is missing some steps. They need to jump. He bravely takes the leap, and fortunately, he lands on the next steps. He urges Su Jin to jump, promising that he'll catch her, but she's scared beyond her wits. 
so he soothes her until she finally jumps. True enough, Ning Yuan catches her, but since the stairs aren't sturdy, it breaks. The two of them fall into the ocean. But even as they're falling, he makes sure that she's safe, and even acts as her human shield. He holds her, and while he sinks to the sea, he laments his powerlessness. Sujin manages to save him and bring him up to the surface. She carries him all the way to the foot of the lighthouse. With Ning Yuan still unconscious, she finds a room at the lowest part of the lighthouse. Despite not knowing if it's safe, she takes the risk and comes inside, carrying Ning Yuan with her. Little does she know there's a CCTV camera inside the empty room. She then sees a little silhouette of a man. He does not speak, so she finds the switch in the room and turns on the light. The lights reveal that the man is a mummified corpse, and a live man is now standing behind her. Sujin is so terrified that tears have started running down her face. But when the man speaks Chinese, Sujin feels relief. The relief is short-lived, however, as he suddenly points his knife at her. The man calls himself Ziyang, and he asks her if she thought he'd let his guard down just because she's a woman. Clearly, he thinks that Sujin is the enemy. He asks her to put down Ning Yuan, which she immediately does. Ziyang then begins his barrage of questions, asking her who she is, what is this place, how did she get him there? The teary Sujin can only tell him that she knows nothing, but he doesn't believe her. She starts mentioning Ning Yuan, saying that he can ask him if he doesn't believe her. After she gives him a rundown of how she and Ning Yuan met, Ziyang decides to question him instead. For a good measure, he warns Sujin that one word from her will earn Ning Yuan one stab. Ruthlessly, Ziyang steps on Ning Yuan's hand and the pain from it jolts the poor man awake. Without even giving him a breather, Ziyang pulls Ning Yuan's hair and points his knife at him. Ziyang asks him what his name is, but he just returns the question. Are you kidding me? I'm the one asking questions here, Ziyang says, before asking if he knows Su Jin. Ning Yuan answers that he doesn't know who she is and she's quick to chime in, saying that they just saved each other on the roof. Wrong move. With that, Ziyang raises his hand to stab Ning Yuan. But he doesn't go through with stabbing Ning Yuan's hand. For now, it's just a threat, one that they have to take seriously if they know what's good for them. He tells Ning Yuan and Su Jin that it's a yellow card for the two of them. Another foul, it'll be the red card. It's already a terse situation for them, but it's made worse by Ning Yuan's strange behavior. He isn't acting right. Hell, the man is literally crying out loud, completely different from the calm and collected man who rescued Su Jin from that prison cell. He insists that he's never met Su Jin before, and she wonders why he's acting this way, why he's acting different. Ning Yuan keeps crying about how he wants to go home, but Ziyang remains wholly unsympathetic. He tells him to shut up and asks him if he's a kid or something. He turns his attention back to Su Jin, questioning why their statements don't match. She explains that they fell to the sea from about 30 meters, and Ning Yuan protected her from the impact using his own body. At that time, the back of his head seemed to take the first impact. She suspects that his consciousness, memory, identity, or some other functions in his mind have been compromised because his head got hit hard. This is usually a symptom of dissociative disorder, but Ziyang doesn't understand a word and demands that she speak human words. Su Jin tries to simplify it for him by saying that this is what they call amnesia. For some odd reason, the man gets mad at this and starts grabbing Ning Yuan again, which makes him cry. With her distress mounting, she pleads with Ziyang, asking what she can do to make him believe them. Ziyang seems to enjoy his authority and having the last word. He asks her to explain to him in one word why was a man she met for the first time willing to sacrifice himself to save her. He warns her that if she pulls any love at first sight crap on him, he'll give Ning Yuan a quick death. Now he's just being absurd. Floundering for an answer, Su Jin asks him, how long have you known your oldest friend? 10 or 20 years? Ziyang replies that he's known his oldest friend for 25 years. They've been friends since he was three, at the orphanage. With that, Su Jin proposes a couple of things. If he thinks that no one can sacrifice themselves for someone they just met, then the length of time they've known each other is the criteria one uses when deciding if they're going to save someone. Given that, will each of Ziyang's lifelong orphan friends sacrifice themselves to save him? If not every one of his lifelong friends can risk their life for him, then how can Ziyang be sure that a stranger won't do it? In short, Su Jin's challenging his idea that the amount of time one's known another person is all that important. To all this, Ziyang replies that at least he can. He's reminded of a time when his friends sacrificed themselves for him. Nevertheless, the little thinking exercise seems to satisfy him, and he finally keeps his knife away from Ning Yuan. The man asks her back if she'd believe him if he said all his friends would do anything for him. Burned by her memory in the snowy mountain, she replies, no way. He adds that it's a pity not every one of them can do this, so he can't win this argument against her. Still, he lets her treat Ning Yuan, but maintains that he still doesn't trust her. Su Jin explains to Ning Yuan that he saved her, but he says he can't remember anything. Ziyang asks him about the last thing he can remember. Ning Yuan replies that he's standing in the corner reading Playboy with Pang in his fifth grade class. That's too far back. God knows how many years it's been since he was in fifth grade. Su Jin comments that Ning Yuan was very reliable before his amnesia. When Ning Yuan's asked to open his eyes, he insists that he shouldn't see what they look like, else he'll be killed like those in kidnapping situations. Not knowing what to do with Ning Yuan, Su Jin observes the mummified corpse instead. 
Ziyang asks what's on her mind, and she replies that it's quite humid there. So how can a mummy be there? Corpses decompose faster in high humidity. She fearlessly touches the mummy and says that it's got corpse wax, which means that the mummy must have been placed there. The three lay the corpse on the floor and find out that there's no trauma, so they can't establish its cause of death. Ziyang guesses that the corpse probably used to be a marine. Sujin proposes that they take off the corpse's clothes and when they do, they find a number carved on its chest. As they try to figure out what the numbers mean, Sujin asks Ziyang about who he is, and he explains that he works for Don Chineone of the Eastern Gang. He got into trouble with punks and escaped by boat. Next thing he knows, he woke up in that place. Sujin remarks that at least he was on a boat. She shares that she was napping in a subway, and when she woke up, she was already on that island. Ziyang says that the way he sees it, the smuggler Ming bumped into the Coast Guard, left him there, and made a run for it. He said that Ming sells anything he can and that they might be one of his cargoes. Ning Yuan speaks up and says that might not have been the case. He recalls that Sujin said they were tossed into a room with a rigged wall. If a trafficker was on the run, he wouldn't bother with doing such a pointless thing. Coming back to this corpse of a marine, the numbers on him are like a code. What's on his mind? In his amnesiac state, Ning Yuan thinks that their situation is more akin to a puzzle adventure game. If his theory is correct, everything they experienced was indeed like an escape game, according to Sujin. Ziyang asks what it is, and she replies it's something that simulates the puzzle adventure game in real life. It's a trendy physical puzzle game among young people today. Ning Yuan adds that players need to collect clues to escape, so Sujin proposes that they find more clues there. Ziyang says that the stairs behind the door are a dead end. He checked it before, and it has been blown up. Since the ladder outside is also broken, he concludes that there is nothing to be explored in the lighthouse. Sujin then notices a scroll in the mummy's ear, which she pulls out. When she opens it, they see a map of an island. She sees a lighthouse on the map, and she says it is just like the lighthouse they are in. There's also another lighthouse marked with X. Suddenly, Ning Yuan tells them that the map seems familiar, but he can't exactly tell where he's seen it. His head hurts when he tries to dig up more memories. Ziyang gets riled up and asks him to spit it out. Sujin, on the other hand, lets him rest and asks if he's okay. Ning Yuan responds that it hurts when he thinks about it. He thinks that he's seen the map while someone was drawing it, but he can't remember more than that. Faced with another dead end, Ziyang gets out of the room to get some fresh air. As he lights a cigarette, he contemplates everything that has happened thus far. A woman playing with a corpse without fear, and a loser playing the idiot. He wonders if the two of them could be Hei minions. The following day, Ziyang wakes Sujin and Ning Yuan up, saying they're leaving the lighthouse to search for the place marked X on the map. Things are still very unclear to them. The only lead is the map they found. If this was really an escape game, three heads are better than one. Now if only all of those heads are working right. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.